the work it takes to build an intimate marriage also refines who you are. It refines your character. Good sex is extremely good for your brain because of the physical, emotional, and spiritual intimacy involved in good sex makes your brain more plastic, meaning it's more open to creating new connections. It helps facilitate learning. Welcome to the Get Your Marriage On podcast. I'm your host, Dan Purcell, a Christian marriage and intimacy expert and coach. I'm on a mission to help couples have the best sex and most emotionally intimate marriages possible. Our episodes cover topics you've always wondered about and are packed with practical advice designed to help you take your marriage to the next level. Hello, dear friend, and welcome to the Get Your Marriage On podcast. This is the podcast where we do a deep dive into the topic of sex and intimacy in marriage. We don't shy away from some hard topics, and some of our episodes are even spicy and slightly edgy. Here's a review I received on Apple Podcasts this week that I think captures very well the mission of this podcast. This woman writes, I just discovered your podcast last week. It has helped open my perspective to the power that sex can have in forming a more intimate connection for a marriage. Thank you for diving so deeply into this topic. I am so grateful I found this resource. I could find answers to so many of the questions I didn't realize I had or didn't know who to ask. It has strengthened my marriage in such a short time. Thank you for that wonderful review, and you said it so well. By the way, if you want to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and you hear me read it on an episode, email support at getyourmarriageon.com, and I will personally send you a gift. Real quick, I have some announcements. In a few weeks, I will be releasing episode number 200 of this podcast. Let's uh, hear some celebration here. Can I get some applause? Right. This is a really big deal. Episode 200, I've been releasing consistently every week for 200 weeks. That's pretty cool. Anyway, I'm going to do something very special for this episode, and I've been preparing for it for a few weeks, and it has already changed me. It has changed who I am as a husband and as a father, and I hope episode 200 becomes your favorite episode because it's quickly shaping up to be my favorite episode too. So looking forward to that. Also in about a month, is September 1st, and that's uh, the first day of Sextember. Now, if you haven't heard, Sextember is a tradition we have at Get Your Marriage On, and I want to invite you to join my wife and I in making September the sexiest month ever. The inspiration for Sextember came from a book I read about called The New American Diet. The author had this idea that if you have more sex, it makes you look younger. So she went all over the country and recruited dozens of couples to try an experiment where they would have sex very frequently for 30 days. Now, whether it was every day or every other day, I don't remember. But what she did is she took before pictures of all of these couples. And after 30 days of a lot more sexual activity between the couple, she took after pictures of the couple. And she published her book. And she's showing that you look younger, you look happier, you have more energy and just life is so much better after you really ramp up the quality of sex and quantity of sex in your marriage over a short period of time. And I love that idea. So I want to invite you to try this experiment with me. How it works is on the first day, I want you and your spouse to take a selfie, uh, just a picture of you two, and then plan for September, make it as sexy as you can, whatever works for you and your schedule. And then at the end of the 30 days, take another picture, like an after picture. And I want you to compare before and after and see for yourself if this experiment really works for you in your life. I mean, what can go wrong, right? <laughs> this sounds like a really fun experiment. So join me in that. Also in the first week of September, we will be launching our next men's private coaching group. This is our sixth cohort that we've ever done with this group. The men in the group that have gone through our program have reported great improvements in their marriages and it's a really special time to bond with other men but it's limited to just 10 men so if you're interested you'll hear more announcements about, about that coming out in my mailing list soon but i want you to have a heads up about it speaking of groups we also recently launched our private facebook group and i invite you to join us this is a great group where we can discuss a lot of the things we talk about on this podcast and you can ask questions anonymously and kind of join our community around this. I believe sex and marriage is absolutely amazing and incredible. Not only does sex feel good, it's also really good for your health. The work it 
takes to build an intimate marriage also refines who you are. It refines your character. Good sex is extremely good for your brain because of the physical, emotional, and spiritual intimacy involved in good sex makes your brain more plastic, meaning it's more open to creating new connections. It helps facilitate learning. I believe one of God's purposes for marriage is that it's designed to help us grow. It's designed to stretch us, challenge us, learn godly characteristics such as patience, love, cherishing, patience, trust, patience, faith, and did I mention patience? <laughs> it's also incredibly, incredibly fun, rewarding, extremely pleasurable, and sometimes absolutely the best thing on earth ever. So today I get to answer some of the questions that have come through anonymously from many of you. I have a form on my website, by the way, where you can send in your questions and I get to answer them once in a while. I hope whoever you are that sent me these wonderful questions, that you find some help and inspiration today. If you want to submit a question, check out the link in the show notes or go to getyourmarriageon.com, click on resources and anonymous questions. All right, the first question today comes from uh, a husband and he says, my wife does not value sex or intimacy in our marriage. We never talk about sex or intimacy unless I bring it up. And usually it is because I am trying to fix the problems so that we can be more intimate with each other. But every time she promises to try to be better, nothing ever changes. What can I do to help her see the value of intimacy in our marriage? This is tough when it's something that you value so much, yet your spouse isn't willing to address it like you want. And I just wanted to let you know I have a lot of compassion for you and anyone else in this situation. I've been there myself in my own journey, in my own marriage. There are at times certain things regarding sex that we just couldn't talk about without it turning into hurt feelings for both of us. And because it was painful to talk about, we dealt with the pain mostly by just avoiding the topic. We learned how to work through it, however, over the years, and with the help of expert coaching, now that's become a strong part of our marriage. So hopefully, a few of the things I can share with you might help you in your situation. The first thing I want you to pay attention to is how you deal with the pain associated with these differences in desire levels or, or what makes the conversation difficult. How you're approaching that is something you need to think about. What is the system in your marriage around this instead of the actual content? Let's talk about that for a second. For example, I used to say when my wife and I had a disagreement things, we, we would just avoid the topic because avoidance became our easy strategy. We would avoid the pain. But avoidance isn't an effective long-term strategy if your goal is to create an intimate long-term relationship. Now, there are other couples that deal with it using other ineffective strategies, such as accommodation. This is where one person will just accommodate the other person in the name of keeping the peace or whatever, but it breeds resentment, and it also doesn't address the root of the issue either. The third losing strategy that is really popular is acting out. This is when you pressure, browbeat, or uh, just really bully your spouse to take your side. This can look like crying, raising your voice, using intimidation, or threats. This can be covert or can be overt, and it might even look like throwing a tantrum. So those are the three. We either avoid, accommodate, or act out. The three A's. Now, part of maturing in marriage is learning how to deal with difficult emotions without being reactive to them. Maturing in marriage is a process where you learn how to keep a clear mind in the midst of relationship pressures. It's the ability to bring your best thinking independently while still staying close in the relationship to your spouse. In short, the work of maturing in your marriage is completely developmental. It's something that, it's adult development in action. First of all, no one likes to feel like they're broken or a project. No one likes to be treated as if they're the one that needs to be fixed. So if these conversations that you're having with your wife are approached from that standpoint, like you know it all and you know what's good for the marriage and your wife's the broken one, she's the low common denominator, she's the bottleneck in the marriage, I don't think those kinds of conversations are going to go over very well. I assume it's really easy for you to see your spouse's failings and shortcomings around her beliefs around sex in this instance. But remember that relationships are a system. Think system like a math equation. There are failings, shortcomings, and faults of your own that are involved in this relationship too, by the way. And you may not be seeing your side of the equation very clearly, 
particularly because our brains aren't very good at seeing our own side of relationship issues very well. So your best bet is to recruit your wife into helping you see your side of the issue so you can address the only part of the whole marriage math equation that you actually have direct control over yourself. Sometimes recruiting the help of a mentor, coach, or therapist you trust can help you through this too. One tool I've used and I still use sometimes in my own marriage when we struggle is I type out a dialogue. Now, whether this is a real dialogue that we had or it's hypothetical, it doesn't really matter. The point is you type out the conversation that, in my case, I'm typing out the conversation I'm having with my wife. And I write it like a script of a play. The very act of writing it out helps me see things in myself that I often miss sometimes because of the heat of the moment. And it's very instructive for me to see my side of the equation and where my shortcomings and logic errors and other faults with my thinking have been. And where I pressure my spouse or I do one of the three A's like accommodate, act out, or avoid. And that helps me really see things clearly there. Another tool that's helpful is to just ask yourself, what are you afraid of? Let's say, for example, you bring up your concerns about sex in your marriage to your wife. What does your wife then do or don't do in response, typically? And what does her reaction to that do to you? What fears does it bring up in you? In other words, if your wife really wanted to stick it to you, what weaknesses in you does she take advantage of? Or what buttons does she know to push? In short, what are your biggest fears? This might be a good starting point for you to understand your role in the relationship. I recommend you check out podcast episode number 189 that I did with Rhonda Farr about a few months ago. We touch on this and even did a role play at the end of the episode to demonstrate how these kinds of conversations can go. Now remember, you can't make your spouse change her beliefs or thinking around sex, but you can change your approach. You can definitely take a closer look at your participation in the system and bring your very best thinking to the relationship. The second question is a great one. And in fact, I've got several questions that are around the same topic. So I've combined them into one giant question. And it's about steamy romance novels. A couple writes, we're curious if it's wise for us as Christians to read steamy romance together. Some couples may already greenlight this, but we've each had our convictions on not reading steamy romance or smut for recreational purposes. Do you think we can repurpose reading steamy romance novels as a positive in our marriage? Or would you discourage this? And another woman writes, I'm wondering what your views are from a biblical standpoint on erotic literature. Not really the hard stuff like Fifty Shades of Grey, but novels that have a spicy scene every now and then. As a lower desire spouse, I find sometimes it helps me get creative in my time with my husband or have a greater desire to be with my husband sexually. Growing up in purity culture, I've always been taught that it was wrong to read stuff like this. But isn't the Song of Solomon in the Bible kind of erotic literature too? So this woman goes on to say this. I'm genuinely curious as to if there is a black and white lines on this in scripture, as I feel they are against porn use, or if this is a gray area. Also curious if this is a gray area, if in your practice you've seen it be more helpful or hurtful to marriages. I don't want to justify the answer I want to hear. I want to do what's best for me and my husband. This is a fantastic question, and I love it. And I've talked about this a little bit in podcast episode 121 with a guest named Ashley. I can refer you to that episode for her experience on this topic. But let's address this a little more deeply here, too, right now, today. So short answer is I don't have an answer for you, and I don't want to just tell you what you should or shouldn't do. I want to instead encourage you to think about this yourself and come to your own conclusions rather than just rely on what I think. In other words, don't borrow my brain. Use your own brain here, your own best thinking to come to your own uh, conclusions. Here's a story that illustrates what I'm trying to say. At a corporation, there is an executive hiring for a middle manager position. And there were three candidates this as an executive was uh, interviewing. So this executive asked each candidate the same question in the interview. He says, suppose you have an employee that's come to work late twice in a row. How would you deal with that situation? The first candidate said, I'd warn him that we have a three strike policy and if he's late again, he'd be fired. So a very like hard line approach. The second candidate said, 
I notice this pattern and then have another employee come early to compensate for this employee, employee's tardiness. Keeping employees happy is important. In other words, a more lenient approach to having a late employee was the second candidate's response. Now the third candidate looked at the executive and simply said, I'd ask him why he's late. And I love that third candidate's answer. I'd ask him why. We often jump right to a conclusion or we look for a black and white answer without asking ourselves why. Why am I using this or why am I afraid to use this? We don't really bring our best thinking to the situations that we have. We don't bring our own brain to the table. So I love that the third candidate asks, I'd ask him why he's late because depending on why he's late will really inform what action I'm going to take next. Too much, especially when it comes to sex, we often look for someone else to tell us what to do because actually that's really convenient, but it's also lazy. Part of growing sexually is learning how to come up with our own answers within the frameworks we've been given. So let's talk about erotic literature or pornography or masturbation or using sex toys or any number of concerns. I'd ask you, why? Why are you using these? Following guiding principles that are in line with your highest values is the best way to run your sex life. If it's okay with you, let me share with you a few of mine that I have thought deeply about. First of all, I personally believe that sex is to be within the context of a committed marriage. Fidelity is the standard. I also personally believe you don't withhold secrets, hide, or take your sexuality into the dark. Hiding isn't how you build trust and intimacy. So much of the pain that couples experience from, for example, disconcordant pornography use isn't necessarily about the pornography itself, but it's the hiding and the dishonesty and the lies around its use. That has been really hurtful. It hurts the trust of the relationship. Another principle is that I believe pleasure matters. We sometimes in our culture think pleasure isn't good. We're supposed to suffer, and if you're having fun or enjoying something, you should feel ashamed for yourself. Perhaps that's how the Puritans thought, but as if like hardship was more virtuous, right? But I don't think God wants us just to suffer. I think God wants us to enjoy life, be happy, and experience all the good that's available to us. And I think sexual pleasure is an absolutely fantastic way to enjoy life. And it's something that we should all enjoy a little more of, right? And let's also be realistic. Your spouse isn't going to be your only sole source of sexual arousal. Heck, driving by the horse pasture near my house and seeing a stallion hump a mare has increased my sexual interest before. You're going to come across things that just pique your sexual interest, whether it's from a book, movie, media, something your friend said, or just a thought that pops in your head. It's going to happen. I know of some couples that choose together to use erotic literature as a tool because it helps with that psychological arousal component. A friend told me that some of the best sex he and his wife had ever had was after watching a movie with a steamy scene in it. His usually reserved wife turned into a freak in bed in the very best sense. And good sex was really good for them. But this brings up a question. What boundaries do you set? What is okay in your marriage and what is not okay? Just because you can turn on a movie or read a book with steamy scenes in it, does that mean you should do it? Does that mean you be boundaryless and indulge? How do you moderate this? You mentioned the Song of Solomon in the Bible. What a great case study of erotic desire in poetic form. Enjoying and being drawn to erotic themes is part of being human, and learning how to harness it to strengthen your marriage and enjoy your spouse at a deeper, more intimate level sounds great to me. Anyway, I hope these principles help you form your own opinions and to bring your own mind to your own problems. For what it's worth, we're having a discussion about this topic right now as I record this podcast in our private Facebook group. Perhaps you can join us there and continue the conversation. All right, the next question is about a fear of bringing up desires. A husband writes, how can I have a conversation with my wife about broadening our definition of sexual intimacy? I'm the higher desire partner, and I would like to experience more forms of erotic touch, foreplay, sensuality, and sex in general, and as a way to connect where, when PIV is off the table. By the way, PIV means penis in vagina. That's shorthand for intercourse. The idea of sharing some of these forms of intimacy, even when we can't go all the way, is so heartwarming to me, but I have been unable to bring it up. This is similar to the first question I addressed today. 
I want to ask you why you're unable to bring it up. What are you afraid of? What would happen if you do bring it up? Can you bring up your desires with great kindness? Can you embrace the discomfort that will come from you sharing your mind honestly? Sometimes we self-edit too much in our marriages because we're afraid of how the other person will react. And that's for good reason, right? We don't want to go around just offending our spouse all the time. That would not be good for the relationship. But sometimes we prioritize relational safety over honesty. When we care too much about safety, the passion in the marriage will begin to die. Guaranteed. I know this is hard to explain. It's kind of like a paradox to solve or a contrary to prove if you want to say it that way. On one hand, marriages need safety and predictability to keep things stable. We'll call this side attachment. On the other hand, marriages need room for people to express themselves, to be honest, to have a sense of mystery, risk, and newness. We'll call this other end autonomy. Attachment and autonomy are opposed to each other, meaning you give up autonomy by being completely attached. And you give up attachment if you go for full autonomy. But there's a balance to strike in between attachment and autonomy. And I covered this concept in depth in a previous episode, number 140 with Amy Gianni, if you want to go listen to that one. So back to your request with your wife for more novelty in the bedroom. Perhaps you'd like to experiment with different sex positions, try oral sex or try sex toys. Can you request what you want with kindness and reveal your mind about the matter? There is something special about being married to someone that's able to share their mind with you honestly, even if you don't agree with it. At least they're being honest, right? And it's good to be married to someone that's willing to reveal their mind. Now you know what they're thinking. That's intimate. Intimacy isn't always the fluffy, hallmark movie gushy romance. Intimacy is also heart-rending sometimes. It's two sides of the same coin, and you take up both ends of the stick when you pick it up when it comes to intimacy. So my recommendation is to be courageous, share your mind, and tolerate the discomfort that comes because it'll grow your marriage. There's no guarantee you'll get what you want, and you're not entitled to any of it. But that's part of life, right? At least by sharing your mind with your wife about what you want, at least by bringing it up, you have earned your own self-respect of knowing you're expressing what you want and what you believe would be good for the marriage. And that in and of itself will help grow you up and grow the marriage too. Next question, this woman writes, my husband is overweight by about 45 pounds from when we first got married 20 years ago. He doesn't want to put forth the effort to lose it. And I'm having a hard time with that. He's getting to the point that he is no longer attractive to me. And it's a major turnoff sexually and physically when he's affectionate. I don't want to not be attracted to my husband. I work hard to keep a fit body, but mainly for me and my own state of mind. Yes, one of my thoughts is, why can't he just lose weight for me, especially when he knows from the time we started dating that having a physically fit husband was a priority to me for health and attraction? I do feel selfish when I think about that, but I don't know what to do and how to handle it. Can you please help me? Thank you. These kinds of concerns are very common, and I get many emails just like the one you just sent from husbands and wives. And it's upsetting when your spouse is no longer sexually attracted to you. That's very alarming and distressing. So I want to validate that. Might I suggest that people gain or lose weight for many different reasons, and it could be health, lifestyle, and so on. But what you're not attracted to, may I suggest, is not so much that he's overweight, but it is that his choices and his lack of motivation to lose the weight, that is off-putting to you. It's his attitude about his weight gain or his lack of weight loss. That is a turnoff, not the weight in and of itself, if that makes sense. For example, perhaps it would be a different scenario for you if, although he did put his best efforts, his thyroid stopped functioning well or, and he gained weight as a result. Or on the flip side, what if, for example, he was still physically fit, but he just sat around playing video games, drinking beer, and scrolling social media constantly? I bet that would be a turnoff, right? It's never selfish to address things you see are going to be good for your overall relationship. Addressing the root of the issue, though, is key here. And I don't think the root of the issue is that he is overweight. I think it's uh, what you perceive in him and your reaction to it. That is the root of the issue here. I suggest you begin with addressing your side of the equation here. What is it that you find hard about your relationship dynamic now? 
where it's difficult to address your concerns with him? How do you manage your disappointment when he doesn't have the same attitude and attention to his body like you do for yours? I once had a coaching client that really wanted his wife to have surgery to lose weight and enhance her breasts because after kids, she had gained some pounds and her breasts weren't as perky like they once were. And she did not want to get that surgery. She felt it was unnecessary, but he really wanted her to do it for him. She knew that if she did it for him, she'd resent him a lot if something went wrong in the surgery. So she said, no, I'm not gonna get the surgery. So instead he sulked, uh, he shut down, he withdrew his affection from his wife, and he even told her sometimes that he just didn't find her sexually attractive anymore. Do you see that the cycle that they're in, in this couple? There isn't gonna be a one-size-fits-all solution here as each couple has their own challenges and their own history and their own patterns of thought that they need to work through. But one thing that we need to realize is that bodies change. The issue you're experiencing right now is a middle age problem. It's to do with this stage of life. In other words, this is more concerning now to you than was probably early in your marriage or how it would be 20 years from now. A good experienced coach can help you through the challenge of what to do when your spouse is no longer attracted to you, because that is definitely a big concern. A good coach will help you get to the root of the issue quickly and help you explore your best choices in the face of the challenges and changes that you're experiencing in your marriage. A good coach should also help you point out your blind spots and push you to grow up around your challenges too. This next question, this husband says, my wife and I were both virgins when we got married and we were shocked and disappointed to discover that penetration was extremely painful for her. I could consistently get her to orgasm with oral sex and toys. I was desperate for sex to be a positive and pleasurable thing for her, but that couldn't change the fact that, quote unquote, the real thing, you know, penis and vagina intercourse, was extremely uncomfortable for her at best. Almost two years in our marriage, she was treated for invasive endometriosis, and the pain and discomfort went away entirely. With the factor of pain and discomfort removed, it was like starting from scratch, but with bad habits to break. Since we had figured out what worked, quote unquote, right? That's the oral sex and the toys. My wife was extremely reluctant and uncooperative about trying new positions. She also had gotten so used to using clitoral toys to orgasm that she didn't want to try anything else, despite our orgasm gap. She usually got multiple orgasms where I often even struggled to get even one. Since it had always been me doing the research and pushing us to solve our problem, the responsibility stayed firmly on my shoulders to push us to try new things. I have been struggling with feeling that my wife is selfish and only cares about her own pleasure, even after I've poured so much love and care into helping her achieve hers. It feels to me like even though I have made it a quest for myself to giving her orgasms, she has no interest in learning anything for my pleasure. For example, after many years of gentle pleading, she finally started giving me oral, but despite my encouragement, she will only do so briefly and unenthusiastically. Compared to the tongue aches I endured learning cunnilingus, this feels very unfair. She has no sex drive, which isn't a surprise, right? <laughs> which is understandable given the trauma associated with sex. But that compounds the problem as it feels to me that she could be perfectly happy never having sex again, which really hurts, even though she enjoys it when it does happen. I know that I can't change her and that more pressure doesn't help, but I'm also hurt and disappointed that even after a rocky start, even after all my devotion and persistence in shouldering this burden of making sex a good thing for her, she seemingly has no care for my sexual fulfillment. We have discussed my feelings and marriage counseling as an option, but she is very resistant to talking about this with anyone. I want to lovingly, respectfully encourage her to be equal partners with me in our sexual fulfillment but I'm open to the idea that I'm wrong-headed in this. Any advice is, is appreciated. I recognize that this orgasm gap in your marriage is very painful, emotionally painful for you. And I want you to let them know that your feelings here are completely valid. And by the way, good on you for doing the work to help solve her physical pain with intercourse. Some couples just complain and not do anything about it, but you actually took action, which is really good. I want to encourage you to look at your patterns on how you keep this old cycle, this old patterns going for a minute. Remember, 
you're not the victim and your wife is the villain in this story. You actually have a marriage system and you got to apply more system thinking to what's going on. Could it be that from the beginning of your marriage, you developed a pattern of being overly responsible for your wife's sexuality, that she hasn't had to develop the muscles, so to speak, to develop her own sexuality? A common pattern at addressing some anxious conflict in marriage, no matter what anxious conflict it might be, a common pattern such as not being able to have sex the way you want to, is for one person to over-function while the other person under-functions. And we did a podcast about this uh, very thing just a few weeks ago with Dr. Kathleen Smith. And I'm reading between the lines here a little bit, but and I could be way off here, but an example could be that you probably booked the appointments with your doctor to treat your endometriosis or to have the surgery. You probably took it upon you to learn more about cunnilingus and what sex toys to buy. I'm guessing you probably bought the dilators and you made sure that she was using them correctly and regularly, that she was doing the exercises. My guess is you probably bought books and read them and studied material on how to get good cunnilingus. Now, your motives may have been virtuous on the outside, but at heart, you are trying to solve your own problem by solving hers. In essence, being a sexual overfunctioner is about being responsible for your wife's sexual outcomes instead of being responsible to her. The way out of this, by the way, is to ask a more thoughtful question. How do I want to relate to my wife that isn't interested in my sexual pleasure? Answering that scary question will give you a lot more insight than trying to convince her that she is the reason for the orgasm gap and associated emotional pain in the marriage. To be completely fair here, she has a role to play in this too. She's been the underfunctioner. If she has been underfunctioning, she let you take charge of something that was ultimately her task to do. And she didn't step up when it was her place to do so. And she didn't take care of her tasks when they were her tasks to do. And perhaps she came by this pattern honestly because maybe in her family of origin, it was really easy for her to let others take responsibility for her in matters similar to this. Another way you can approach this problem in your marriage is to check with what energy you're coming into each encounter. Consider, are you feeling entitled to an orgasm yourself? Desiring something good is different than entitlement. Entitlement is a sense that you're owed something. It's hard to be sexually excited with someone that feels like they're owed an orgasm from you. Nothing in life is guaranteed, by the way, and we're owed nothing from our spouse, sexually or otherwise. Just to be clear, orgasms are amazing and definitely worthwhile and worth pursuing. And frankly, Americans need more orgasms than we're having right now in our lives. There's nothing wrong with desiring orgasms and making sex more pleasurable. There's nothing wrong with wanting your wife to touch you, to be more enthusiastic in giving you oral sex or whatever those desires might be. All of that's completely valid. However, it seems like you're married to a woman who doesn't want what you want. And this is a difficult position that you're in. So in my opinion, how you handle yourself in this difficult position is more important than getting your needs met. It's the, what do you do? That's what matters more. This is a good situation where coaching or counseling for just yourself might be a good step forward to help you work out your side of the situation within your marriage. When you make the goal of counseling to fix your wife and your perceived injustice of her selfishly hoarding all the orgasms in your marriage, I can see why she wouldn't be motivated to want to try counseling. The path out of resentment in your marriage is to remember that you always have a choice. If I were coaching you, I'd encourage you to consider what your options are, even your crappy options, and see what you can choose that you can actually live and make peace with. All right, here's my last question for the day, and it's a great one. I'm titling it, How to Woo a Husband. This woman writes, Hi, Dan and Emily. I have a question regarding romance. I have noticed that my husband responds better to my initiations of sex when I romance him first, making his favorite meal, preparing a bath, etc. I came from a family where the husbands do all the romantic gestures, so this is new to me. Do you have any recommendations on how to woo a husband and make him feel loved? I could really use some new ideas. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're asking this question. And by the way, this is a great candidate for our uh, private Facebook group. This, you can get other people's opinions here too. And just a plug for that. But I'm glad you're asking this question because every person listening to this podcast should become a master at seducing their spouse. 
And I'd say Emily is really good at wooing me and seducing me because she knows me so well. And hopefully she would return the same thing, say the same thing if she were here, that I'm good at wooing her, right? The key is to be enticing and to be a really good option for your spouse. By the way, there's something about the way you phrase the question that I want to point out. You can't make your husband feel loved, but you can create an environment where it's likely to happen. And that's what we're going to focus on. Also, I want you to be aware of needing him to respond to your invitations. Neediness is very unattractive. I say this because it's entirely possible to go through the same motions at wooing and enticing your husband, but if it's coming from a place of anxious neediness for your spouse to respond like the way you want them to, it's going to be a complete turnoff. Now, I don't know your husband very well. I just know how I like to be seduced, so I'm introducing a lot of my own bias in my answer here. But I can suggest that the number one thing that excites a man is to be with a self-confident, turned-on woman. A woman who is confident in herself and turned on is very attractive. And if you do an internet search, you'll find full of tips and tricks on how to seduce your man. Let me just give you a few ideas. Remember, in general, men are more visual when it comes to sexual cues. Can you dress in a provocative way or flash him? Would that get his attention? In this study, they had heterosexual men view images of women in the nude, and they had a system set up where they had eye trackers so they can track where the man's eyes go first when they see a new image. And guess what the first thing on the image a man placed his eyes? It was her breasts first, and then her hips second. Anyway, how can you use this information to seduce your husband? My next suggestion is to be a bit more explicit in your communication and build some anticipation. In general, this is again speaking very generally, uh, men tend to be too explicit in their wooing their wife, and wives tend to be too uh, soft or gentle in wooing their husband. So we need to flip that around a little bit better. In other words, women need to learn how to be more direct and a lot more explicit. You might even call it, you need to be more R-rated, but maybe R as in uh, uh, really good at turning on. <laughs> Come up with another meaning for the letter R in that. Just think of it as being sexually confident. For example, you could text your husband, I love your penis in my mouth, or my clothes are coming off promptly at 8.45 p.m., and then the bedroom door gets locked at 8.46. What are your plans this evening? Another can be, I feel like such a woman when your body is tucked inside me. That's, those are some ideas to be a lot more explicit. Does he like to dance? Can you turn on some music and ask him to dance with you? Does he like massages, foot rubs? Does he like it when you read to him? Is there something steamy you both could read that would help both of you get in the mood? Another option is to be more direct with your touch. Generally speaking, men don't mind direct touch to their genitals, their behind, or their chest, whereas women do tend to mind that kind of direct touch. You can also push your man against the wall and kiss him passionately while you slowly undress him. Now, I could go on and on, but I'm starting to blush here, so I'm going to stop. Besides, I'm far more interested in teaching principles than specifics here. One last thing to note. There are times when all of your efforts to seduce your husband are going to fail. You do the right things, and he's still not going to be interested. And this is just real life. But how you handle yourself when things don't work out is the real measure of the marriage, not how things go when things do work out, right? Can you and your spouse talk about what it means for him to be wooed by you and what it means for him to be romanced? I hope these suggestions are helpful for you. I hope this episode has been helpful for you as we talk about and tackle all sorts of questions and concerns that you might have in your marriage. I love this work. I believe that building an intimate, passionate marriage is one of the most important things we're ever going to do in this life. Intimacy is hard. Building an intimate marriage, not just a functional marriage, takes a lot of great personal growth and personal sacrifice, but it is well worth it. I hope you're inspired. I hope you're uplifted. I hope that these things help you and your marriage move forward. Now, if you like this episode... You perhaps you'd want to download the Intimately Us app if you don't have it yet. This app is full of all sorts of ideas, suggestions, games, activities that you and your spouse can do to grow together sexually and intimately. 
Also, you can check out our website. We have tons of resources on our blog. Check out our past podcast episodes, our new Facebook group, our very active Instagram, and our YouTube channel, where we post all sorts of fun and interesting things, all designed to help you have the very best sexual relationship with your spouse. Now, if there's anything that you listen to today that you feel like you could use specific help with in your marriage, I suggest you check out my program. It's the Get Your Marriage On program. This is like the capstone of all the work I've done for the last seven years, all pulled together in one place. This is the ultimate way for you to get a new upgraded marriage. This is a place for you to see your old patterns that don't work and to replace them with patterns that do work. This is a way for you to learn how to have the deeper, vulnerable conversations with your spouse that really move the needle forward so you can have a sexier, more intimate marriage. You'll find all that information at getyourmarriageon.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next week. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe, like, or even comment below, and go see what other wonderful videos we have that will help you strengthen your marriage intimately.